Ostrov and Paige Billenbaum, and who really need no introduction to all of you. And um, this is part two of their kind of series with the Early Childhood Treatment Center. And just in case you missed it, we will be posting the webinar in the portal. So please, if you missed that, go back. And this is just such important information as we really move into working in the perinatal period. So um, today we're gonna to focus on perinatal depressive disorders, depression, bipolar depression, and psychosis. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to Paige and Dr. Bergdorf. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, it's wonderful to be back uh, here with so many of you that I know I've attended either one or two of our previous trainings and welcome to everyone uh, who is here for the first time. Um, I'll do my best not to be redundant, but being mindful of the fact uh, that there are some new people here. I might repeat, repeat a few things, so bear with me. Um, but again, as Evelyn mentioned, Dr. Berndorf and I are going to be speaking particularly about perinatal mood disorders, right? When we talk about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, the acronym for that being PMADS, that includes a whole host of disorders and symptoms that sit more on the side of anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder, which we spoke of last time. So if you didn't have a chance um, to catch that, it sounds like that training is available um, to watch after the fact. Um, so as mentioned, uh, PMADS is the acronym for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. These are a group of illnesses that impact about one in five women. Uh, or birthing parents. What I always like to say um, as a retort to that is that those of us who do this work know it's probably more like one in three, but because there is such an enormous shame and stigma that surrounds maternal mental health, 80% of all cases go undiagnosed and undetected, um, leaving uh, all of those women struggling silently. And since the pandemic has taken place, uh, there is, there's been global studies done um, across the world uh, that have found PMAD rates to have risen to as high as anywhere from 40 to 72%, depending on the country. But that just gives you a little bit of context in regards to uh, how universal this problem and this very important issue is. I will also add that in light of the uh, overturning of Roe v. Wade, um, we do anticipate that PMAD rates will go up even higher when we look at some of the uh, risk factors for uh, developing a PMAD either during pregnancy or postpartum, one of those very clearly is an unwanted pregnancy. Um, we also can uh, attribute PMADs to miscarriage and a number, other, a number of other uh, physical and external stressors that impact the mental health uh, uh, of a new or expecting mother or birthing parent. Um, all right, the other thing I, I wanted to add, and I know we're gonna get to this too um, in, in an upcoming slide, and maybe it's here. Yes, it is, so I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. So as I said, one in five uh, women suffer from a PMAD. 80% of those cases go undetected and undiagnosed, most importantly, untreated. Um, a big part of why that number is so high is that women are very fearful of the fact that if I tell somebody how bad I'm feeling, how disconnected I am from the baby, if I tell them about my scary intrusive thoughts of harm coming to the baby, they will take my baby away. They will deem me as an unfit mother. Um, and that silences many women and birthing parents from talking about what's really happening for them. Uh, PMADs are the number one complication associated with childbirth. And I really want that to sink in. Rates of PMADs are significantly higher, if not double that of hypertension or gestational diabetes. Yet we focus so much as a country, and rightly so, on maternal health outcomes. We focus so very little on uh, maternal mental health outcomes. Uh, and in fact, I'm sure this will show up on another slide, PMADs are the leading cause of maternal mortality here in New York City, and one of the leading causes of maternal mortality nationwide. Uh, it is so important that we talk about these um, unacceptably high maternal mortality and morbidity rates, um, and we associate them to improving health outcomes. 
that we include improving mental health outcomes as a part of that conversation because they are a leading cause. And despite what most people think of um, as postpartum depression, that it can only happen in the postpartum, actually 50 cases, 50% uh, of cases develop during pregnancy. So to repeat myself, because these are important statistics and I tend to get ahead of myself, um, you know, for women of color, uh, PMAD rates are significantly higher. Um, they are double that um, for new white mothers. Uh, as I mentioned, they are one of the leading causes of maternal mortality in this country. Um, and situations that are happening across the globe right now um, in regards to the pandemic and also the recent overturn, these rates continue to rise. Um, and Dr. Berndorf and I can speak to that firsthand. <clears throat> Our phones have been ringing off the hook, um, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, over the past few weeks. Um, and it, they, the phones have been ringing off the hook with really severe and acute cases of women um, often that need to be hospitalized because their symptoms are, are so concerning. So just a few seconds on why it is that 80% of those cases go undiagnosed and untreated, building that out a little bit more. Uh, women don't wanna talk about it. As I mentioned, they're afraid if they tell anyone that they're gonna have their baby taken away. Um, they feel like an entire and utter failure as a mother. What type of mother would feel this way about her baby? Disconnected, feeling like she made a mistake, regretful, wanting her whole, own old life back. Um, and this, this romanticized version of motherhood, which is this very blissful, unconditional love towards your baby. Motherhood is natural. It's what we're meant to do. It's one of the best things that will ever happen to us. I'm supposed to be happy is what so many new mothers and pregnant women and birthing parents experience. Uh, I don't have to tell any of you um, who, are, who are active on your Instagram feed that social media is overflowing with images um, and depictions of our best self. Uh, the same applies to motherhood. Uh, we see pictures of beautiful babies and smiling mothers and connectivity and gorgeous family portraits um, and, and this, this pressure to put one's best foot forward. And so when you are bombarded by all of these happy images all around you, it makes women feel as though they are totally alone they're the only one that is feeling this way because clearly everybody else is enjoying this the way they're supposed to. Um, and they blame themselves. What's wrong with me? Why don't I feel that way? I'm doing this wrong. A lot of women and birthing parents keep their symptoms secret, even from their family. Um, you know, mental health universally is something um, that, that still carries a sense of taboo with it. Um, and for many different ethnicities and cultures, uh, there, are, there are mental health stigmas in which we don't talk about mental health at all, right? Um, and so there can be a lot of secrecy around it. Sadly, friends, family, and doctors, we're starting to see a shift in this, don't ask. Um, you know, we have a saying at the Motherhood Center, the pregnant princess and the postpartum pauper. Um, you know, everybody's really interested in a, in a expecting mom. When does she do? Is it a boy or a girl? Has she decorated the nursery? All of those kinds of things. But then when the baby's born, it's almost as though I read recently the, the analogy of a piece of candy and a candy wrapper. The mom is cast away like the wrapper of the candy. Um, and nobody's asking mom, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Women feel a sense of guilt, shame, isolation. Um, and again, they're worried that if they tell anybody how bad um, it actually is, uh, that they'll have their baby taken away. So we're gonna shift a little bit um, to types of PMADs, but today um, focusing on mood disorders, we're gonna focus um, on four, primarily three, um, of, of which are gonna be the baby blues, postpartum depression, bipolar disorder, and postpartum psychosis. Uh, and about 85% of women experience some mood disturbance during the postpartum period, right? And this is when we're lumping in the baby blues. That's why this, this percentage is so high. 
Most symptoms are mild and short-lived. However, 10 to 15% of women develop more significant signs of mood disorders. Um, and what I think can be helpful sometimes is to conceptualize these disorders on a spectrum, um, baby blues being the mildest and psychosis being the most severe form of a PMAD, which 99% of the time um, requires uh, hospitalization. Excuse me for my sensitive uh, mouse here. Okay, so Dr. Berndorf, I'm gonna take baby blues and then I'm gonna hand over to you um, the, the, the more acute diagnoses. So many of you, if not all of you, have heard about the baby blues. Baby blues impact, some studies suggest 80, some suggest 85% of all new um, mothers and birthing parents experience some iteration of baby blues within the first two weeks of postpartum. These symptoms can typically peak on the fourth or fifth day after birth, um, and they may last for a few days or up to two weeks postpartum. That two week mark is very important because we look at um, as clinicians, if those symptoms uh, carry on beyond the two week mark or become more acute or intense, there might be a PMAT at play. And some common symptoms uh, affiliated with the baby blues, mood swings, feeling anxious, this is a brand new delicate little baby that mom has just brought home, feeling sad and weepy, sometimes not really knowing why, feeling irritable, overwhelmed, crying. Um, these are more mild symptoms. They don't take up, as I oftentimes say with symptoms, all the space in the room. Um, they are things that, that many women experience and again, tend to dissipate over the two week mark. And now Dr. Berndorf, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Paige. Um, good to be back um, talking about the mood disorders. Uh, so perinatal depression. Um, and, and I said this before regarding the anxiety and um, compulsive disorders. These are, this is, we're going to talk about depression, bipolar disorder, psychosis. We're going to talk about those. And they are pretty much what they are, not pregnant or postpartum. So I don't want anyone to be under the um, I have the idea that these are super hard to treat or diagnose. They're confusing because they're in this specific period of time, but they really are relatively the same. And I'll point out some of the qualitative differences, but generally speaking, we use all the same symptom lists from the DSM that we use for depression, unipolar depression, bipolar depression, and all the iterations of that, and also psychosis, okay? And I'll, I'll describe that in the perinatal period, but just know that this is not super, super special. It is, you got everyone who is a treatment provider will know this, I hope, and um, know this kind of basic stuff. So um, perinatal depression uh, can emerge during pregnancy or over the first two to three months postpartum, but don't get caught on that. It can appear at any point, even beyond a year of birth. Now, we wouldn't probably call it perinatal, but what I always say to people is, when did it begin? And often you'll find it, it began in the perinatal period, but they might be have a five-year-old and just say, I've never been treated. So you can have just a smoldering depression that just, or any illness that just never got treated. So don't, again, it's diagnostically these things make it confusing, but the time frame is really, it's both important and not important. Um, some of the risk factors for having a perinatal depression and perinatal being during or after, uh, personal or family history of depression or anxiety. Um, again, if you're having it in the pregnancy, you're already having it. Um, people worry about postpartum, but you're already having it in the pregnancy. So you're going to have it in the postpartum if you don't treat it. Um, so history of PMDD, uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, financial, any stressors, financial, marital, um, any kind of adverse uh, stress-related um, experiences in your life, complications in pregnancy are common uh, causes of uh, depression, perinatal depression, birth or breastfeeding issues, um, labor difficulties, trauma around birth, NICU stays. Uh, may make it more likely to have a perinatal depression, history of infertility, thyroid imbalance, 
we have to look at, uh, we have to rule out the medical reasons for this happening. So it's important that you get a basic panel of lab work. And again, that it, it can't be overlooked because sometimes there are these occult causes of any psychiatric disorders that are really medically based. And if we don't look at them, we may very well miss treating, you know, hypothyroidism that was really, um, you know, masquerading as uh, depression. So again, this will be familiar to most of you. Um, symptoms, what are the classic symptoms of depression? Um, depressed or sad mood, tearfulness, lack of interest in the baby, lack of interest or loss of interest in usual stuff that usually brings you pleasure. Um, feelings of guilt and shame are very common. Worthlessness or incompetence, particularly around um, the baby. I don't know how to do this. I'm so, I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible mom. Uh, feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, sleep disturbances, any changes in appetite or sleep, concentration difficulties, loss of energy. Now, you will notice that while these are all signs and symptoms of depression, they are also very common signs and symptoms of both pregnancy and postpartum. So for anybody out there who has been pregnant, you will know that half these are common in pregnancy and postpartum. So they get it gets confusing for one, it can be confusing for oneself, it can be confusing for one's family, and it's confusing for providers because everybody wants to believe it's just a transition. So, ah, you're fine. Everybody has trouble sleeping or eating or, ah, your energy, of course it's low. You know, like you're recovering. So yes, that's, yeah, yes, true. What is never normal? Never. Hopelessness, never normal. Okay, guilt and shame, never normal, right? These are not things that you should be feeling Okay, that that in the that's not classic pregnancy postpartum related symptoms, right? That's just not. So you always want to ask about the other things, like feelings of not wanting to be around. Like, have you ever thought about hurting yourself, or are you having intrusive thoughts about harm coming to the baby or hurting the baby? You know, even if you don't want to, right? That again, those are, believe it or not. Those can be associated with um, things like OCD and anxiety disorders and depression, and they can also be associated with nothing. You can just have them. And they might not represent illness, but, but they're not, I wouldn't say they're exactly typical. So you want to be asking about these things. But that's what I always say when I talk to patients um, and they say their doctors or their providers said to them, oh, you're fine. I always say, well, did they ask about or did you mention, you know, hopelessness, helplessness, worthlessness, uh, you know, guilt, um, feeling like you don't want to be around. I mean, those things, never normal. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. I'm just going to add to that, you know, one thing I always like to highlight um, that, uh, that often gets missed um, and is really indicative of you know, perinatal depression and, and really PMADS overall is that symptom of irritability um, and how those feelings of frustration, and I'll go so far as to say rage, um, can be so powerful, you know, especially for women that might have kind of categorized themselves as very even keel, go with the flow, um, but they, they feel this intense anger, and it can be directed at their partner, it can be directed at the baby, can be directed at themselves. Um, and I think it's another one of those symptoms where people are really ashamed to talk about it, right? Like who would say, I'm so mad at the baby, right? Well, at the motherhood center, we would say, well, of course you're mad at the baby, right? Like this little beautiful person came along and turned your life upside down, right? It, it looks and feels like nothing that it did before, right? You're not able to sleep. It's this little person is not saying thank you to you or, hey, mom, you're doing a good job, right? Like it, it, it makes sense, right? We do not want to see that continue, right? Which is why treatment is so important. But it makes sense that that a new mother would feel this way. Sorry, no, excellent irritability. So that's one of the the irritability and anxiety. I mean, Paige makes a great point. Those are not classic symptoms of depression, but those are actually qualitatively a lot of what we see in women who have depression perinatally. So they won't 
tell you all these things here on the right of the screen, but they'll tell you they're angry, irritable. Um, they, you know, don't like anyone, every, everything bothers them. Um, and that could be depression. You'll get these other symptoms, right? You need these, again, diagnostically for um, a diagnosis, but it, sometimes it's obscured by irritability. Irritability is like, <laughs> irritability and ambivalence. Like, why did I do this? What kind of mistake did I make having this kid? And the other thing we say a lot here at the Motherhood Center is you can have those kind of kind of negativistic feelings that feel terrible to talk about and you may feel ashamed about having and love your baby or not hate your baby. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That you can, you can feel negative and positive at the same time. That that's a very um, uh, complicated concept, but that it's one that we teach you know, it's the dialectic um, that, that's taught often in DBT and other skills um, and ways to think about complex emotions, but both things can be true at the same time. Opposites can be true at the same time. So it's important to recognize that you can feel horrible and still, right? Was, women will come in and they'll have all these symptoms and they'll say, but I'm not depressed because I don't feel depressed, right? Which you don't have to, that's not an absolute. You can feel have a low mood or um, loss of pleasure. Um, but they'll say, but I love the baby, but they have everything else, right? That doesn't negate it. So what's next page? We've got bipolar disorder. Okay, so perinatal bipolar disorder. Okay, so similar to bipolar disorder in the general population, um, it's characterized by a fluctuation of extremely high and extremely low moods. Uh, the difference being that the onset occurs during pregnancy or in the days or weeks following birth. Um, this can, that's most typical. It can also appear like we have somebody we're treating now where this is appearing, we're seeing them for the first time at eight months postpartum. Sometimes it self, it kind of simmers in this way and you don't see it until another pregnancy. But when you go back, you realize it started in a previous pregnancy. So. And there's just been like, un, someone's been a little bit unwell for a long time. So, but the classic presentation of bipolar disorder is in the, I would say a week to two to three weeks postpartum, like within the first month, you see like, a, you see a big change. Um, you can see um, lots of energy, lack of need for sleep, racing thoughts, feeling overproductive. I, you know, you need to stay up because you need to like take pictures and put them in albums. And, you know, like you've got very increased kind of goal-directed activities. Um, you can be really irritable or you can be really fun and, and kind of high in a, in a, you know, in that sort of manic, the way manic gets used kind of colloquially, like, um, you know, racing around. But Irritability is also um, the other option, which is super unfun. And the people around you notice that um, a lot. You, it's, it's, you know, the other thing that can happen in a perinatal bipolar, when, when bipolar disorder comes, um, comes up anew, uh, it's often in a first pregnancy. Um, and it's often, again, comes out of nowhere. This is like scary because people are like, what, what's going on? Um, and you can have very, um, uh, you can be yourself on one hand, but also be having a delusion or parent, like paranoia or feeling like your baby's not your baby. I mean, all, all kinds of, you can lose touch with reality in these very, um, odd ways, which is kind of what psychosis is, right? Because uh, bipolar disorder can be with or without psychosis, but, um, this sort of goes into the next category that we're talking about and why we put postpartum psychosis on the, in a way, on the affective, on the mood disorder spectrum, because it seems to be different than schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders. So I hope I'm making sense and not going too fast, but bipolar disorder often shows up as psychosis in the postpartum. Okay, so it can show up as mania, 
that elevation, that grandiosity, that I can do anything and I'm going to stay up all night and do it and I don't need to sleep and get out of my way and why are you bothering me? Don't tell me I'm, you know, loss of judgment. It's like, don't tell me I'm doing this. I'm the best in the world at this or, you know, it, it, it's a really, uh, it's really remarkable and it's very markedly different than the person was before. So you got a family that's kind of saying, what is going on? And the person saying, what's wrong with you? I'm fine. And by the way, this doesn't always feel terrible, right? Patients or, you know, people sometimes like this because you're getting so much done and you're living large and you're, you think you're doing great, but it's a, it's, it's a very unstable state that can um, lead to all kinds, you know, that you've, you've heard the story, you know, people running through the street, I'll take my clothes off and I'll run through the street. I'll buy, you know, nine cars on a credit card that I don't even have, you know, like all kinds of things have happened. This happens in the postpartum, right? And it happens typically within the first month. Um, again, it can happen later, but when you see it happen like that, um, and, and when it's psychotic, more so than manic, um, well, both actually, it is bipolar. I'll tell you a little bit about that in the postpartum psychosis, but this this is not this is not un, oh, it is uncommon. It's not this is not a super common disorder, but it is very important to get it treated um, and to make sure that patients are safe and that the babies are you know baby is safe and that the family is aware and that they can contain um, someone, particularly if they're psychotic, but that it gets recognized because what happens is sometimes it doesn't get rec recognized and it just simmers along and it's kind of like hi. They're a little bit high and they're irritable and they're acting odd, but you can't quite nail it and you you miss it. And then it goes on and on in the brain, kind of there's kindling and it gets harder and harder to treat if you don't grab it. So risk factors for something like this include history of bipolar illness, right? Then you're on the look for it. Um, and then if the family has a strong history of bipolar disorder, you are much more likely to, um, I'm watching you, right? We're watching. If, they, if, you're, if there's a known history, we're watching. And if there's a known history of just mood disorder or any other kind of psychiatric disorders, you can, um, you are at risk for, it. one is at risk. But again, this is not such a common illness um, in, in the general population. Um, and the risk is not elevated, believe it or not, in pregnancy. It's just that pregnancy and postpartum is a time at which it might show up. Does that make sense? So this is a stressor for, this is often when it appears, if you're gonna start having it in your life. All right. So postpartum psychosis. So bipolar disorder, while an urgent thing to treat, and again, can go undetected and under the radar, um, psychosis is an emergency. And it's an emergency and again, not that the bipolar illness isn't, but um, we do think postpartum psychosis uh, as a rule is bipolar illness that was previously un unknown or started fresh, right? That started new. And it's coming out with straight up psychosis. Psychosis, loss of touch with reality, delusions, strange beliefs, hallucinations, irritated, the hyperactivity, there could be underactivity, um, decreased need for sleep, Paranoia, suspiciousness, mood swings, difficulty communicating, waxing and waning, um, uh, appearance or uh, appearance of symptoms. So it's really a very profound state of disconnect and confusion. And it can, again, it, you can see people who stop talking. You have the sense of somebody who's kind of missing. There's a paucity of speech and ability to communicate. Again, some, I remember, you know, medical students when I was teaching a lot would say things like, I didn't get any information from the patient. I was there. I tried. I was like, that's information. The fact that you couldn't get any information is so much information. That's data because you might not get, because they might just be looking at you and responding to their own internal stimuli, right? Or they think you're somebody else or they don't trust you. I mean, it's a very, um, upsetting state for everybody involved. Um, but it's an emergency that, um, again, occurs in about one to two per thousand deliveries. And uh, it's sudden. It can happen uh, as early as, I think the 
earliest I've seen it is probably five days postpartum. Um, uh, it, it can it can happen again. You can have psychotic illness like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, psychosis, secondary to other things. But that is not what we're talking about. This kind of postpartum psychosis is really an affective or mood disorder. That's that's our current thinking. Okay, that it is related. No, that it's related to, it's on the spectrum of a mood disorder. It's sort of bipolar at its, at its most extreme, okay? Um, so there is an interesting, I'll just make an interesting uh, comment about something interesting in the last several years. Um, I have had several patients and there has been interesting research done by a colleague of ours, um, who's originally from the Netherlands, but um, who, who is looking at orphan um, postpartum psychosis. So while I'm saying to you that it is almost always bipolar illness, there are some cases of women who only have psychosis in the postpartum. That's it. And it doesn't come back. We don't know if that's going to be the case. So we treat Everything postpartum psychosis as if it's bipolar disorder. So I'm just going to comment that we use things. We often start lithium and a second generation antipsychotic like olanzapine, risperidone, uh, um, quetiapine. Uh oh, did we just lose Catherine? Here. Okay. I don't hear her. Um, okay. So I'm going to pick up well, where she left off and she's going to come back and talk to us a little bit more about medications. Um, you know, what I would add is, you know, just to give some, some kind of real life experiences of how psychosis might show up, that paranoia that people are out to get me, my family members are out to get me, you know, the things that we hear about, right? That like my phone is tapped or I'm being followed by the government. Um, hearing voices, um, oftentimes that are um, commanding um, somebody to do something. Hi, we lost you oh. there for a sec. Hello, I called into another meeting and hit the wrong button. I I've done that too, I've done oh. that too. It accepts instead of decline. No worries, really. I was just giving examples of like auditory hallucinations and commands, oh. like some concrete of how it shows up in paranoia and Thank you. religious undertones and things like that. Yes, yes. Um, I, I I often tell the a couple stories that are emblematic um, of patients that from long ago where, you know, once I was, you know, a patient who I'd gone to visit in the hospital, my, my office used to be in the hospital uh, over at NYP. And um, I would go up and visit patients if they if we had arranged it in advance so they weren't worried that a, their psychiatrist was coming to visit and their family didn't know, you know. Anyhow, I went to see a woman who had known bipolar disorder, but had done very, very well in pregnancy. She was well medicated, we thought. And when I went there, she was great. And a week later, uh, one week postpartum, I got a call from her husband and I could hear her in the background and she was screaming, get off the phone. Who is that woman you're having an affair with? I know it's her, you know, and I said, this is an emergency. You need to hang up with me and you're going to call an ambulance because I think if you take her to the hospital, she may, she could jump out the door. Like it's not a safe moment and it's an emergency and we need to get you to the hospital and we need to get you safe. So safety is like a huge priority here. So she was very activated, paranoid um, and having these thoughts and was really against her husband um, the thoughts can be against the baby, right? In the worst case, scenario, right? they can be against the baby. They can be against yourself. This is, you know, the un most unfortunately infamous story um, of the Andrea Yates case. Uh, Andrea Yates actually had a psychotic disorder. So it's a little bit different, but to just to evidence kind of what happened was she believed she was bad, evil, unacceptable, uh, and that if her kids, um, were her kids, they, because they were her kids, they were also doomed. But if she killed them and they could ascend to heaven, that they would be saved. And she had a very complicated uh, delusional construct that um, pushed, allowed her to, to kill her kids. And 
if she were in her right state of mind, she would never have behaved that way. If she had support and treatment and wasn't pushed out of the hospital because of the insurance companies not paying for further treatment, she would not have done that, right? Nobody, nobody behaves that way when they're in their right mind, right? And right, extreme religious beliefs as well, right? Very much. And um, a lot of failures in the system for this woman to be at that place, including, you know, I have many things to say on the subject, but that is an story of an extreme horrendous case. And just to make another point, we criminalized and it's only going to get worse um, in the recent, in recent history with our, with our current, um, with current political, the per current political climate where, um, you know, we're going to be criminalizing women for miscarriage and for all kinds of things. So it's not going to get any better that we, you know, we're the only country, right? Like nobody understands how in this great place of America, we, um, uh, you know, we allowed this to, to, to happen and that we put her in jail for this event, which, you know, this, these tragic events, which really had to do with um, her illness. So anyhow, I could go off. And yes, I'm seeing comments in the, in the chat. There's a lot more, a lot more on this. Okay, Paige, is it you or me? You go. Um, I can kick us off, but please let me know if I get anything wrong in the medication category. Um, okay. So one thing I want to stress is that for these more severe diagnoses and groupings of symptoms, therapy and or a support group usually isn't going to cut it. Um, that when somebody is experiencing this acuity of symptoms, they require a higher level of care. Um, and I have these kind of tiered out um, based on acuity. Um, medication can be uh, a wonderful panacea um, to all of, if not many of these symptoms, right? And some common antidepressants uh, that we prescribe to women that are experiencing depression, um, fluoxetine, escitalopram, I can't say it, escitalopram. escitalopram. There you go. Sertraline, yeah. citalopram, paroxetine, you know, for those of you who are more familiar with with um, Lexapro, Celexa, Paxil, Wellbutrin, um, all different types of antidepressants that we use to treat depression. Um, as Catherine mentioned, um, for bipolar disorder and psychosis, you know, we are really suggesting to our hospital hospitalization step down. So women that have been hospitalized for um, bipolar psychosis, that the gold standard is the combination of which Catherine speaks, lithium. Um, along with uh, another one of these antipsychotics. So Seroquel, Lanzapine, Lamotrigine, Risperidone. I don't know if I'm missing any. Well, you're only, the Lamotrigine is a, an atypical um, agent for mood disorder, but yes, you're doing great. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, and so, and then if therapy and medication are not enough to meet uh, the illness where it's at, um, there are higher levels of care. Um, and what we are best known for at the Motherhood Center, um, especially for those of you who are new, is we are the only perinatal partial hospitalization program uh, in New York City, in the state of New York, um, and only one of a handful nationwide. Uh, we are an Office of Mental Health, New York State, Article 31, licensed perinatal PHP. Uh, so we are the only game in town when it comes to stepping up from outpatient treatment, right? So therapy, therapy, and medication. Um, there are also uh, programs called intensive outpatient programs. The difference between the two, IOPs are less intensive. They usually are three days a week for three hours a day. Partial hospitalization programs like our own are five days a week, five hours a day. Um, our programming includes everything from group therapies to individual therapy, um, skills learning, skills from, from cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, couples counseling, an on-site nursery, partner support, um, uh, infant care, 
uh, art therapy. It's a very, very comprehensive program that meets the needs of women that are experiencing a higher level of acuity of PMADS um, and also helps women feel significantly better much faster because it is so intensive. Um, but then in those cases that Dr. Berndorf mentioned, especially in the case of psychosis, this is a medical emergency and this requires immediate hospitalization. Um, and we have um, been dealing with this quite a bit um, in the past couple of days and weeks. Um, women whose symptoms are so acute that they need to go to the ER, get evaluated and hospitalized on an inpatient unit. Um, <clears throat> almost 99% of the time, if somebody's actively psychotic, they are going to be hospitalized. The amount of time that they're there, it can vary. It can be anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. Um, what I will say is sadly in this country, uh, we do not have any true form perinatal hospital programs, right? Um, where women who uh, need to be hospitalized can bring their babies. We see an abundance of these, particularly in Europe. Um, in America, we have none. The closest we have is a program in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, um, which does provide a perinatal inpatient hospitalization. There are a lot of accommodations made where women can be with their babies much more frequently than if they were in a hospital that didn't allow for this throughout the course of the day. Um, there's another program even closer to us uh, in Long Island affiliated with Zucker Hillside. They too have a women's unit with a track um, specifically for women, um, you know, expecting mothers uh, that are experiencing acute symptoms. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a question um, I just want to answer. Can hormone replacement therapy help in some cases of milder PMADS? You know, I'd like to say we know the answer to that. Uh, right now, the answer is essentially no. Um, maybe allopregnenolone, maybe this is why Brexanolone, the, um, uh, the, the uh, IV infusion, right? We, we have some thoughts that some one of the metabolites of progesterone may help, but straight up like repleting the hormones that are um, missing or that are plummeting after pregnancy doesn't solve the problem. Like estrogen and progesterone being super high and then plummeting after delivery, um, right? Highest at the end of pregnancy, falling afterwards. It doesn't solve the problem. Uh, so generally speaking, and even in milder cases, I would, I would never not use known efficacious treatments in favor of Hormone replacement. In fact, I would probably not use hormone replacement. We really don't have evidence for its um, uh, being efficacious. But thank you for asking. People always wonder. And before we get into the heart and soul um, of today, which is an awesome case presentation um, that will be presented to you by a member of our audience, I know that there's some new people here today. So I just want to run through really quickly who we are here at the Motherhood Center and what we do so that you know that you can and should use us as a resource. Um, we treat perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. We are a leading um, maternal mental health clinical treatment facility here in the city and nationwide. Um, we offer uh, clinical care and support on, on many different levels, but as you've heard, what we are known best for and what we do exceptionally well is our day program, aka perinatal partial hospitalization program. I mentioned to you five days a week, five hours a day, all of the different components. Average length of stay for women who come to us is usually around four to six weeks. It can be a little bit longer. We're currently offering an in-person day program option again, which has access to our on-site nursery. So babies are cared for while new or expecting mom is in treatment with us throughout um, the majority of the day. It's from 10 to three is when it runs. We also have a virtual uh, day program that runs. So we have those two options now. Um, we have treated thousands of women since we opened our doors in the past five years. We've saved hundreds of lives. Um, and it is a wonderful option for women um, who need a higher level of care. So for all of you who are learning about us for the first time, please take advantage of what we have to offer. Our process is simple. Either a provider can make a referral directly to us or a potential patient can call herself. We conduct a screen, get her booked for an evaluation, and then recommend the best course of treatment. 
which could either be the day program, or we also offer outpatient. So we offer individual therapy with perinatal mental health specialists, both social workers and psychologists. We also offer medication management. Our, our uh, medical providers on our staff are all reproductive psychiatrists. So they specialize like Dr. Berndorf in meds that are safe and effective to take during pregnancy and the postpartum. We also do trying to conceive consults. So for women, as came up earlier before any of you joined, who might be on medication, but are concerned by, worried about what should I stay on, what can I stay on, please send them to us because what we really, really don't want to have happen and yet what happens over and over again is for those in the medical community that are not well-versed in the efficacy and safety of perinatal medications or just general medications in the perinatal period, they will suggest that a woman go off all of her meds entirely. Um, and I think the case presentation speaks to this. We do not want to do this, right? Because the risk is so great that those symptoms might have a resurgence in the perinatal period that can be significantly more detrimental um, to a woman staying on her medication. Um, so we do those trying to conceive consults, we also do support groups. We have a wonderful working relationship with nurse family partnership. If any of you are working with patients that are also working with NFP, we offer free PMAD support groups in English and Spanish. Um, it's a great place for women to learn more about PMADs and also not feel so alone and be able to speak to other new and expecting moms that are struggling too. We also have our own PMAD support groups, miscarriage and loss groups, pregnancy support groups. We do all kinds of education for any of you that are providers and want to continue learning more about the specialty of, of perinatal mental health. We do monthly provider seminars four providers, one a month, if not more. Um, and we also um, are always pushing out new and relevant information, research, updates um, on, on perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. So again, just to reiterate, we are here for you. Um, and I'll give you our contact info at the end. But without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to our presenter, Deborah. First of all, I just want to thank Deborah for volunteering to present a case. And again, as always, we really like to combine the theoretical and what we learn with actual live experiences. So Deborah, thank you so much for offering to present and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to hearing um, your thoughts. Um, so I'll just dive into the case. My client is a 29 year old female um, and she's of Southeast Asian descent. She's English speaking, she's married. Um, and oh, we included her assessment scores here at intake. So at intake, her assessment for um, depression on the PHQ-9 is 21 and it's 21 out of 27. So um, it's pretty severe, the depression. And then the ACE score was three. Go on to the next slide. So when I met her, um, the client's presenting concerns were that she was experiencing severe anxiety and depression, um, a loss of motivation. Like she, she described not wanting to do anything and things that she used to like, she couldn't enjoy. Um, like she, she even described her husband telling her, giving her the car and telling her she could drive and go do some shopping. And she just couldn't, she said she, she couldn't, um, she, she, she didn't look forward to it. She, she had the ability to, and she just couldn't go. And um, then she describes difficulty falling asleep. And then once she falls asleep, having difficulty waking up and um, feeling overwhelmed upon waking up um, and having feelings of dread, um, constantly feeling tired and feeling inadequate about caring for her baby. Um, the client also described experiencing extreme stress just prior to this pregnancy because she had a very late stage miscarriage. And that late stage miscarriage also followed multiple miscarriages before that. Um, she says she, they struggled with getting pregnant and then she was pregnant and was able to carry this child for a while. And when that late stage miscarriage happened, it was very traumatic because she had to undergo surgery to remove um, 
the baby, the baby had died inside. And then, um, and then also when she went in for that surgery, she contracted COVID at, um, around that time, or they discovered she had COVID. And then she, because of the COVID, when she was in recovery, um, she was isolated. She and her husband were isolated from family and any other supports. Um, and the client also described experiencing severe symptoms of depression after that late stage miscarriage. And so she was prescribed uh, fluoxetine by her primary care doctor. Um, and then soon, she said a few months after that late stage miscarriage, she got pregnant again and she stopped her um, medication. And then she gave birth via emergency C-section. And she said that was also quite um, stressful um, because she said something about not being able to have the day that she wanted or something. And then she said that after the birth of her child, she felt very blue and she cried. She found herself crying often. And she described it as, um, I thought everything would be better after I gave birth, this child that I wanted so much, but like my feelings surprised me. I didn't have the feelings that I thought I would have. Um, she's very tearful during her intake sessions. Um, and interestingly, her intake, her first and second intake sessions were a month apart because she kept just not, she just missed sessions or she canceled. Um, and then... Um, I, I had to put down a diagnosis for her. So it was major depressive disorder. Um, and then, um, and then our clinic psychiatrist endorsed it. Um, uh, you can go, to, oh, thanks. You moved on to the next slide already. Um, her family history, um, the client described that she had in, at, the first two intake sessions, the client described that she had experienced trauma as a child when we were doing the ACEs, but she said she did not want to discuss this further. Um, and she described her husband as extremely supportive um, and her mother as supportive, um, but also very moody. So, um, so she had to be careful when she asked for support. And then her father, she described as always checking in to make sure that she was okay. And also a person who she, um, who she could count on to iron out things if there was conflict between her and her mother. Um, and then at a later session, our, I think it was the third session, this client described her um, childhood trauma. And she said that when she first immigrated, she was sent to live with relatives. Um, away from her parents because her parents were working longer hours. And um, during this time when she was living with her aunt and uncle and cousins, um, there was an older cousin in the house and she said she endured repeated sexual assaults from him. Um, and then she said that when she was, well, and then she, uh, her, she said that her mother noticed that she was very unhappy living in this home and eventually moved her back to live with her own parents. Um, and she said that when she was an adult, she disclosed this to her parents, um, but, but her parents, she did not experience support or comfort. Um, she said her father actually denied that it could possibly happen. And she described um, that she felt that her family's priority was to hide these things um, and not break up the family because if, if they confronted the cousin or the uncle and aunt about this happening, it would break up the family. Um, so, and then the client told me that she prefers to avoid talking about this past trauma and works hard to suppress it and move on. And um, so that was that. And then the client also describes having friends and cousins but not being able to share much about her struggles because she's embarrassed and um, also because she knows that they will not really understand and be able to support her. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, this is a relatively new case. Um, really, it's been challenging to 
to have develop a cadence in our sessions because the client often cancels last minute or just doesn't show up for our sessions. Um, we're scheduled to meet weekly for 45 minutes in Zoom, but um, because she doesn't show up, I've seen her only like once a month. Um, the client is engaged when she does meet with me, um, but she often expresses ambivalence about whether talking really helps her. Um, However, as our session progresses, she discloses more and more. And in the end, she tells me that she, um, she didn't realize there were so many things on her mind um, because often she just feels overwhelmed with her feelings and her soundness. Um, so it seems like that I've established therapeutic alliance. Um, the client also told me that she recently stopped breastfeeding and is considering going on medication again, but she also um, described feeling shame that she has to go back on medicine. She, she said she believed that once she had her baby, she would, she would be really good and she would be happy. And so she feels ashamed that she has to think about going back on medication again for depression. Um, and then the client also describes her husband as being very concerned. Um, so there was one she, one time I met her, she said her she had sent her baby to her mother for the first time. And she, so she could have the whole day to herself and rest. And then her husband became very concerned and came home. From, he came home and told her that he had to run errands for work and she had to be in the car with him because he, he just didn't want her home alone um, being sad. So he, he tries to be supportive as best he can. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, the client describes feeling frustrated that she isn't able to emotionally care for her baby. Um, although she says physically her baby's doing well, she feeds her, she keeps her clean, um, she's growing. Um, and the client, um, Oh yeah, and then the client also mentioned that time that when she sent her baby to her mother um, to give herself a break, she wasn't able to enjoy that time off from the baby. Um, and the, this, uh, when she sent the baby to her mother, the baby was about five months old. Um, the client also is anxious and depressed that she's not enjoying her baby more. And she describes it as not giving enough to her baby. Um, and the client also expressed a protectiveness and not wanting anything that has happened to her in her own childhood to happen to her baby. Okay, and then you can go to the last slide. So these are my questions. Um, one big question is I'm having trouble. It seems like I, like I can't get her to show up for our sessions. Um, so at first I, I got suspicious. I'm like, is she just stringing me along because she wants a letter um, for her job? Because she did mention that she wanted, like eventually her company might contact me for a letter that she's going to therapy. Um, but then um, I talked about this with my supervisor and also that, that like her behaviors are also related to her depression. Um, so then it's hard, like how do I engage this person in treatment when her symptoms seem to impede for engaging in treatment. Um, and then my second question is, you know, like this big, there's all this big trauma, like this really heavy trauma from her past that she tries to um, suppress. And I think that's related to her depression, but like, what do I do address first? Um, and then I, I have some concerns when she keeps talking about like her relationship with her baby and worrying that she's not emotionally really available to her baby. Um, and I'm in peace, uh, perinatal CPP for, I'm in training for that, but, um, this baby is a little bit old to be a case to study for that. Um, and then my next question is also, how do I help this client in her depression when she keeps having this, like telling me this nothing helps mentality? Um, and then my last question is, how do I help the client recognize her anxiety thought patterns without sounding dismissive of her concerns? So lots of questions. If you get to one, I'll be really happy. <laughs>
Well, Deborah, I just want to thank you so much for this excellent presentation. And when I read through the slides a few weeks ago, and also again in preparation for this, I realized just how many points you hit. Um, in this particular case presentation in regards to what Dr. Berndorf and I just um, were talking to everyone about. Um, and I like the first thing that comes to my mind is just the, the, the pain that this new mother is in, right? And the, and the other thing that comes to my mind is of course she feels this way. Um, and when I was going through your slides and just kind of taking inventory of what we know of this woman's life, um, and we think about um, what type of, of life experiences can contribute to the onset of a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. I mean, I almost checked every single box, right? So we're gonna start with, in her earlier lifetime, um, being the victim of repeated sexual assault by a family member, right? not being able to process that when, with anyone while it was happening. And then when she attempted to confide in her parents, um, her father told her he didn't believe it, that didn't happen. Um, that whether it was culturally or just a family dynamic, that, that was not allowed to leave the family, right? So she was, not only did it happen to her, but when she tried to kind of seek assurance and help, she was told that she was not telling the truth and she was given none of that. Right, So she's held this repeated traumatic experience inside of her all this time. Um, what I do want to um, point out in this particular example is what we know, sadly, um, and I think the last time I read a statistic on this, is that 50% of all women are victims of some form of physical or sexual assault, um, which in and of itself is, I, there are not words for. The perinatal period can be incredibly triggering and activating, particularly for women that have experienced some form of sexual assault or abuse in their life. Um, and it can bring, it, it can reactivate, even if someone's been in treatment, but more often than not, they have not been. It can reactivate their central nervous system and all of their trauma responses that are associated to that experience or set of experiences. There is a direct, direct correlation. Um, this woman went on to have a late stage miscarriage, it sounds. She had to have the demised fetus removed from her body. Um, oftentimes when this happens, right, whether it's um, early term miscarriage or late term miscarriage or stillbirth or, or whatever it is, so rarely do women receive or, or seek tr mental health treatment to process that tragic loss and grief affiliated with what she has been through, right? And so as we all know, like if we have no, if there's nowhere for this to go, it's still inside of us, right? We even had a chance, this hasn't gone anywhere. We still hold it within. Um, and then she becomes pregnant soon after. She has no time to grieve the loss of, it sounds like what happened. I can only imagine how anxious she was in her subsequent pregnancy, considering what happened the first time. Um, and then she has an emergency C-section, right? With her subsequent pregnancy, contracts COVID in the process, um, and then is home with this infant, right? Um, and is not on her medication. Either it was a decision of hers or perhaps somebody in her medical network advised her to not be on her meds, right? And so here she is in her most vulnerable state trying to navigate new motherhood, right? So when we just like look at it at its face value, then we start to ask ourselves, how could this woman feel connected to this baby? How could this woman not feel hopeless or helpless or enjoy anything um, or feel as though she was doing a good job, right? Like, how could she possibly feel anything than what she's feeling right now? So I, I think this inventory is really important because when we look at risk factors, she's like hit just about every single one. Um, that's not really answering a question, but I'm gonna pause for a second. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Catherine. I just beautifully stated. I mean, basically, Deborah, your patient, Paige asked the question at the end, how could she not 
be suffering. I mean, she's suffering, she's been suffering, right? So she comes into the pregnancy suffering. She's never had anything that she's dealt with. You know, it doesn't sound like she's really had any kind of treatment or uh, successful treatment at that. Like, and, and, and why would she think anything would help? She told her primary supports, her parents, right? And they said, Shh, don't talk about it, right? Secrecy and shame. So now, even if they believe her, which it's not clear that they do, the father said, I don't believe something like that could happen. And he sounds like he, you had described him as protective of her. So I'm sure it's extremely hard for him to, he can't allow that into his, he has to disavow that because it's too much, right? And again, I'm not blaming him. I'm trying to sort of think about what might be at play, but she's told, it, it, please, it couldn't have happened. So denial, like not validating her. She was invalidated. Her feelings were, she was told to push her feelings down and she was told to keep her mouth shut. I mean, that she's gotten this far is wonderful. And, and she should be commended for, you know, you should focus on her strengths and what she's able to do and how she's caring for this baby. But everything comes back to roost in pregnant, in postpartum. Like you can think you have, you know, pushed it down just well enough or far enough, but as Paige said, it will, it doesn't go away. And the only way over something is through it. So you cannot, and I would explain that to her when she says, why should I talk about this? But you might want to even say it to her. Like, why would you want to talk about this with me? Why would you trust me, a stranger who purports to want to help you? when your own family wasn't, couldn't hear this or validate your feelings. And if she were somebody who was sort of like, what if she said like, well, what if I was lying to you or something? I don't know, I just had this twisted thought. And then she could, sit, could feel like she could trick you, therefore she couldn't trust you. I mean, the truth is if she feels she was traumatized, she was traumatized. Trauma is in the eye of the beholder. It doesn't matter if someone touched her weirdly or had penetrative sex with her. Like it's, she was violated in whatever way she experienced, and that is legitimate for her. Your job is not to prove the veracity of it or to deny it. It's simply to listen to it and bear witness to it and be able to validate and support her in walking through it, right, in getting through it. Now, there are lots of ways to think about trauma treatment. Um, and so you ask, you know, what do I do first? But I mean, first and foremost, it does sound like Deborah, you have a lovely relationship. I mean, you are providing a safe space for her to be. So you're already 50% is showing up. Okay, so great job. And, and after that, it's providing the space for her to gain trust in you. And, and again, I think it's very, you, you can, I think, again, your therapeutic alliance is growing and you are. I think to be able to say to her, like, why would you trust me? Right? Like, I, I, know, I know I'm a trustworthy person and I'm here to do good work with you, but why would you think that? Right? Your, your, your family, the people that, that you thought you could trust the most let you down. And that is so, that's been, you know, almost all of us have been let down by our parents. Um, but this, this, you know, some people experience it that way, others don't. And um, that's a lifelong, you're carrying that around for a long time. So, so beginning to talk, and some people won't bring it up because they don't want to dishonor their parents, right? I don't know, culturally for her, if she even feels comfortable talking about stuff like that, because it may feel like she's, you know, whispering in your office about things that are um, taboo to even speak up. So again, you can say to her, it's confidential. I won't tell him, you know, this is between me and you. She, you can't answer you're not if her parents call I, you know whatever like it's confidential and you will keep her confidence and you will hold that with her which is such a, again a very powerful thing to be able to say like you can bring this to me with us in our session and together we hold this right you don't have to hold it alone so you're providing a space and a place to share and, you know, she may say, I don't want to burden you, but you're trained, right? You're a trained professional who can say, 
you can share this with me, don't, I will take care of myself. This is about you, right? People, sorry, Paige, I hear you. No, 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 I, I don't mean to interrupt you. Oh, I, I, I'm just riffing here, then. go. I just, I, I, I just, I, what's, what I really want to shout out at you, Deborah, is like, this is a woman who, to Catherine's point, attempted to tell her parents what happened to her and they told her what they did. And she might very well have never shared this with anyone else before, but she's sharing it with you. And that is huge. And if that doesn't speak to therapeutic alliance, I don't know what does. And as with anyone who's experienced trauma or has had, you know, this type of, of experiences with their parents or what have you, like trust is not high on her list of things that comes easily for her, right? And so she's gonna move slow. And the fact that she even told you what she did, uh, what she did about what happened to her says a lot about you um, and her feeling safe with you and starting to trust you. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing I wanna say is, you know, we have a, a thing that we say about the work we do at the Motherhood Center and a lot of women who leave us say the same thing, <clears throat> that we mother the mother, right? And in this particular situation, this is a woman who, I don't know a lot about her mom, but I, but certainly in this particular, you know, what we do know, this is a woman who wasn't mothered, right? Um, and what I see is such a, a glaring strength for her is that she's identified, I don't want the same thing to happen to my baby that happened to right. me. That is huge, right? That awareness, um, is such a protective strength, right? For her baby to, to potentially have a different experience than she did. But like <clears throat> right now, validation um, and, and normalization, I would say are like your two best friends. And to Catherine's point, validating, right? Like you have been through so much. The fact that you are showing up today and sitting here in this room with me is amazing, right? I can't imagine how 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 hard this must be, right? But but I am I am so proud of you for showing up and being here, right? <clears throat> Validating anything that she shares with you, right? Like I'm feeling hopeless or helpless or I'm ashamed or embarrassed. Those are really, really common ways to feel after a woman has a baby. I want you to know that, right? Like feeling depressed and anxious is the number one complication associated with childbirth, right? 30% or more new moms feel exactly like you do. It's just, we don't talk about this enough. You are not alone. There are so many women out there that feel the same way that you do. So I want you to know that. Um, and, and, and just validating what she's telling you and, and mothering in the sense of you're holding space for her to show up and and be this in your presence um and and i you know i i i also want to stress right um and this is why sometimes i roll up my sleeves when i'm talking to providers or others of like oh well we we give a print out of resources to a new or expecting mom that we're worried about okay well that's helpful and if you're a new or expecting mom who's severely depressed or anxious or whatever's going on, picking up the phone and calling a provider to find yourself mental health treatment when you feel like you're drowning in an ocean and all you can do is keep your head above water to breathe, not in your, in your capacity, right? Um, so I, I share this because if you see this in the beginning of establishing your relationship, that perhaps someone's not showing up um, I want you to know that it, that it 99% of the time comes from that space, right? I can't do it. I'm not worth it, right? Um, and, and those are obstacles that can get in the way of somebody connecting regularly with sessions and care. But like, Deborah, you're on the right track. The fact that she showed up twice, I think says a lot. Um, and what I would say about the depression versus trauma you know, um, a lot of what we do with Mother Center, particularly in the day programs, like we're focused on the here and now. What are the presenting problems in front of us, right? And what we're looking at are the symptoms of depression. Now, I say this because processing and recovering from trauma 
can be a life's work, right? This is work that will go on and far exceed the work that you do with her. Not to say that you are not fantastic, Deborah, and you will make great strides, but, but being able to process, heal, and recover from the type of trauma she's experienced is going to be a long time commitment. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to try, try to stabilize her right now to the best of our ability and help minimize and decrease those depressive symptoms that she's experiencing. And then we can start to look at the trauma. Um, but but I, would, I would vouch and I would suggest let's deal with the trauma first. Um, there were a couple Wait, of pain, pain, depression. Yeah, depression. I'm sorry, what did I say? I'm sorry, yeah. I mixed up depression. There were a couple of resources that I wanted to offer to you as well. And I have a resource slide after this that I'm going to share. Um, relationship with baby. A big part of what we do at the Motherhood Center is dyadic therapy. And it is basically about bonding and attachment with baby. It is an integral part of our care um, because this attachment can be, it can manifest in so many different ways for those of you who are familiar with attachment theory. Um, and so often um, having this impaired attachment is very synonymous with postpartum depression, anxiety, and all of the other PMATs. Um, a wonderful resource if you are not, if you don't have exposure or training in dyadic therapy um, is the Annie Bergman Parent and Infant Program. Um, and they offer, home visiting services where dyadic therapists will go into the home and work with a mother and infant specifically on attachment and bonding. And correct this if it's wrong, Catherine, but I think it's free. Um, they are a training program, so they train clinicians in dyadic therapy. And as a part of their training experience, they do this work in home, in the home with mothers and babies. And they're always looking for women who will, who would like their services. Yeah, very special. Yeah, those are great ideas. Um, how do I help this client in her depression with there's a nothing helps mentality? I mean, I think to what Catherine said, right? Like she's been, there's been this, if not several occasions in her life when she has been told, quite frankly, you don't matter. This doesn't matter. Um, you know, this isn't, what, what you're saying isn't important, it isn't valid. I'm sorry, a whole bunch of messages just popped up on my screen and blanked out my slide, so I can't even see what the question was. Um, there they go. Um, nothing helps mentality. I, I would work with it, right? Like Catherine said, I, I mean, of course you feel like nothing works, right? And of course, in this moment of great despair and distress, that hopelessness and helplessness prevails and makes it so hard to feel like anything could help. And what I might use with this particular intervention is I might even insert a little bit of motivational interviewing around her previous experience with medication, right? So what was it like when you were on medication before? I know you said she quit breastfeeding and she was thinking about it. I mean, I, I quite frankly want this woman on medication yesterday, um, but how can we get her back in touch with what it was like to have her symptoms treated by medication and work with her to kind of move the dial a little bit more in the direction of, of taking, getting back on those meds, right? And what Catherine will always say is like, let's start with what we know works, right? Like if she was on something that was effective before, let's start there. We don't have to start in the very beginning and figure out what she responds well to. Um, so I'm rambling. Um, I'm gonna- no, I well, it makes me think, and I, I totally agree with you, Paige. And why was she taken off meds in pregnant? You know, it sounds like she got taken off in pregnancy. She went off. Why'd she go off? Do we know, Deborah? I think she just didn't think it was good to be pregnant and taking meds. Like same idea that she's breast, she's nursing, and now she's stopping nursing, so that maybe maybe she should go back on meds. Like I had asked her when I first met her, because I was like, she'd probably do better with meds. And then she had said, oh, I'm, I'm nursing right now. I, I don't want to do meds, but maybe if I stop when I stop. Well, she can be on meds in pregnancy and she yeah. can be on meds while breastfeeding. And yeah. she, like the majority of the world, both, you know, clients, patients, doctors and providers alike think like that. It's like less is better, right? Less is best. 
but that's it's actually not true. We have to we have to think about it in an informed way so that we can make a decision about how severe her symptoms are. And with a 21 out of 27 on a PHQ-9 with the hiatus score, like she needs to be on meds immediately, right? People come up with all kinds of things. It's gonna hurt the baby. It's gonna, uh, I won't be able to, but that's the way I bought. Like she probably feels no other connection. I, I don't know. We haven't said much about her attachment to the baby or how she feels, but, um, and that's why dyadic mother baby work is so probably imperative, but you're gonna do it with her individually anyhow to talk to her about that because again why should she know how to connect and attach with a baby when she doesn't have a template she doesn't know what to do right and she's gonna have to learn that and that you're gonna work through that with her you know work on that with her but um you know a lot of people feel like meds are gonna get in the way but sometimes their depression and their past trauma is what gets in the way of them being able to be connected to the baby. So the meds actually decrease symptomatology that and thus allow them to be to begin to do the work, get connected, and then ultimately get to the trauma. And by the way, it's impressive that she told you anything about the trauma. Um, but yes, as we've said, you want to go for the the you can treat the acute depression for all we know, it's been, this is acute on chronic, right? That you, you should, that should get treated ASAP. And the, the, the trauma is lifelong and that's going to be something to work on once she's well enough to manage that, right? Like you don't go after trauma when someone's in a crisis. So you hold, you just hold space for it and you're holding it with her. And you can say, let's not, you don't want to push it away for, like if she wants to talk about it, that's fine. But I would, I would, from your perspective, probably not um, go there too deeply at the moment. And you might say, you know, I want to talk about it and we will get to this. Let's first kind of like address what's at hand so that we can get you back on, on, on to a stable ground. And then we can, then we can do the deeper work. But you're having it, she's in a, she's in a crisis right now and, and you've got her and again, if she shows up, you're you're on your way. And she's on her way. That's that's as good as anything. It's a couple of questions in the chat um, and about what resources and, and things that, that I had mentioned. Um, and so there's a couple of things I want to review here. Just pretend like I didn't spell the motherhood center wrong in our um, web address. Let's just pretend <laughs> that that's not wrong. Um, but I, I want to reiterate to everyone, we are a resource to you um, for outpatient treatment, medication management, um, the partial hospitalization program, support groups, um, directing people to the NFP support group. We are here for you. Um, now, as it pertains to medication in pregnancy and postpartum outside of us, right? And in particular with this case, we're not sure why she went off her meds, if someone counseled her to, or if she did it herself. But for those in the medical community that are unsure about whether or not someone should stay on, is it safe? There's two resources I highly recommend. Project Teach is one of them, which I understand, I think you, you all work with already, but they have a maternal mental health reproductive psychiatry hotline where anybody in the medical community can call, speak to a reproductive psychiatrist, actually the best in the nation um, from Mass General, um, that will advise them on what medications that patient should either take, stay on, go off of throughout their pregnancy and postpartum period. Postpartum Support International, which is like the godmother of everything PMAD related and has been around since the 80s and provides resources to women across the globe in regards to postpartum depression. They recently initiated a perinatal psychiatric consult line. In a similar vein, providers can call, speak to a reproductive psychiatrist and get advice on medications to take during pregnancy and postpartum. Um, what I mentioned earlier, the Annie Bergman Parent Infant Center, um, the, the project is called the Home Visiting Project and the website is right there. Um, and again, they will send those in training um, to the home to work with new expecting mothers. Um, there's also a lot out there about dyadic work. Um, 
perhaps maybe some of you want to get trained in dyadic work. Um, a number of our clinicians at the Motherhood Center are because it's so integral in the work that we do, particularly with new mothers. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention um, for women, particularly um, that are on Medicaid, a program opened up about a year and a half ago rather silently in Queens called the Macari Perinatal Intensive Outpatient Program. So we talked earlier about PHPs, which is what we are, um, and IOPs, which is what Macari is. It runs out of the Child Center in New York. Um, and they have a Queens location, again, for pregnant and postpartum women on Medicaid. Um, and it's, it is intensive outpatient treatment, three days a week, three hours a day, um, where women can go in person. I believe they have a, a non-site nursery as well for maternal mental health treatment. Um, they do not have a psychiatric um, arm. They do refer out for medication, I believe, um, but it's groups, individual therapy. It's a higher level of care. Um, so those are a, a couple of potential resources that might be helpful for this patient and, and many others that, that you all are dealing with. Um, and I see uh, that Evelyn is back, so I'm going to stop talking and Evelyn, turn it over to you. Well, I just, first of all, I want to thank you, Deborah, for a very rich case that really provided a lot of uh, material for us to really talk and think about. And again, many thanks to Paige Bellenbaum and Dr. Berndorf. These presentations have been so informative, and we hope to be reaching out to you again as we kind of progress in our work here. And you've not only given us such information, but also resources. So it's been such a pleasure working with you, and I think you've really helped inform our network. Thank you so much. And we are going to do an evaluation. We'll put that in the chat box and ask people please to complete it but thank you so much and uh we look forward to our continuing work together thanks thank you deborah thank you thank, thank you, you deborah Dr. Brinder. thank you Paige. thank you deborah thank you evelyn it's always a pleasure to be here um and please please use this as a resource um if anybody comes across new or expecting moms that need um, perinatal mental health care terrific thanks so much take care everyone great to see you <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. I thank you.